Thank you, sir. So tonight we are going to do Romans chapter 9. And I don't know if you guys have read it. Well, I'm going to read it all, all the way through, and then we'll go back through it. But it's probably the most hotly debated chapter of Scripture in the whole Bible. Um, there's some, you know, things in it. And, and I will always tell you when there's two sides of things. And I will tell you if I'm uncertain of which side. Tonight, I'm really certain. <laughs> you know, I, I fall on one side of this debate. And to me, I think it's pretty obvious. Um, but we'll go through all that. So last week was what I would call pretty practical. The things that we went through last week, I think, man, you can just put those into your life and it's really practical. This week, I hope there'll be some practical, but it's going to be more theological. So if we get to the end of tonight and you liked it, you qualify as a Bible nerd. <laughs> if you like tonight, you are officially a Bible nerd. I'm a Bible nerd and I love this kind of stuff. And I've literally been studying Romans chapter 9 for going on two years now. I mean, just straight studying it. I've studied the book of Romans for years and years and years, but just specifically Romans chapter nine, because it is, and actually in first Peter, I think it's chapter two or second Peter chapter three, I think um, Peter says, some of the things that Paul taught are hard to understand. <laughs> Peter actually said that about Paul. And uh, this is one of those things. I don't, I wouldn't call it hard to understand, but I would call it easy to misunderstand. So it, there's this teaching that, that we'll talk about. And if you hear that first and then read this, then you can go off in a wrong direction. And I just thank God I never even heard of this other stuff before I, I had already made a decision on this. I probably 15 years ago before I even knew about this other stuff that we'll talk about, um, I had already made a decision based on what the whole Bible said. You can get in trouble when you pull out certain scriptures and try to build doctrines around those um, individual scriptures. So you have to see it not only in the context that it's in, but in the context of the whole Bible. And one of the rules of Bible interpretation is if you have a scripture that's hard to understand, you interpret it by scriptures that are easy to understand. So if this one is, makes total sense and it helps you understand this hard one, you use that. So let's go ahead and, and read the whole um, chapter. Chapter 9, start in verse 1. It says, With Christ as my witness, I speak with utter truthfulness. My conscience and the Holy Spirit confirm it. My heart is filled with bitter sorrow and unending grief for my people, my Jewish brothers and sisters. The Apostle Paul was a Jew. I would be willing to be forever cursed, cut off from Christ, if that would save them. They are the people of Israel, chosen to be God's adopted children. God revealed his glory to them. He made covenants with them and gave them his law. He gave them the privilege of worshiping him and receiving his wonderful promises. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are their ancestors, and Christ himself was an Israelite as far as his human nature is concerned. And he is God the one who rules over everything and is worthy of eternal praise, amen. Now the word amen, we kind of look at it like that it's the end of something, you know. We say a prayer and then we say amen, like it's the end of the prayer. But amen actually says, let it continue or let it be. Let what I've just said be true. Verse six, it says, well then, has God failed to, fill, to fulfill his promise to Israel? No, for not all who are born into the nation of Israel are truly members of God's people. Being descendants of Abraham doesn't make them truly Abraham's children. 
For the scriptures say, Isaac is the son through whom your descendants will be counted. Though Abraham had other children too, this means that Abraham's physical descendants are not necessarily children of God. Only the children of the promise are considered to be Abraham's children. For God had promised, I will return about this time next year and Sarah will have a son. This son was our ancestor Isaac. When he married Rebecca, she gave birth to twins. But before they were born, before they had done anything good or bad, she received a message from God. This message shows that God's or God chooses people according to his own purposes. He calls people, but not according to their good or bad works. She was told, your older son will serve your younger son. In the words of scripture, I love Jacob, but I rejected Esau. Now I wanna stop here just for a second because this is kind of the core of what people misunderstand in this. And if, if anybody has their Bible app, um, I, I just want you to turn to like the NIV or some different version, New King James or something, and look at the scripture. And I'm guessing, Joey, that verse 13 in your Bible says, I love Jacob, but I hated Esau. Does it say that, verse 13? <clears throat> just as it's written, Jacob I love, but Esau I hated. I hated, yeah. See, that's what most of them say. Most versions will say that. The thing I love about the New Living Translation is it actually talks in our language, like our current language that we talk in. So rejected is a better way to see that. But we're going to reference it later and go for the hated because that's how most people read it. That's how most versions are, is it says, I love Jacob, but I hated Esau. And that's kind of the, the grounds of this, what I would call a misunderstanding of what's going on here. So verse 14, back to the New Living Translation, it says, are we saying, are we saying then that God was unfair? Of course not, for God said to Moses, I will show mercy to anyone I choose and I will show compassion to anyone I choose. So it is God who decides to show mercy. We can neither choose nor work for it. For the scriptures say that God told Pharaoh, I have appointed you for the very purpose of displaying my power in you and to spread my fame throughout the earth. So you see, God chooses to show mercy to some and he chooses to harden the hearts of others so they refuse to listen. Verse 19, well then you might say, why does God blame people for not responding haven't they simply done what he makes them do? Verse 20, no, don't say that. Who are you, a mere human, to argue with God? Should the thing that was created say to the one who created it, why have you made me like this? When a potter makes jars out of clay, doesn't he have the right to use the same lump, lump of clay to make one jar for decoration and another to throw garbage into? In the same way, even though God has the right to show his anger and his power, he is very patient with those on whom his anger falls, who are destined for destruction. He does this to make the riches of his glory shine even brighter on those to whom he shows mercy, who were prepared in advance for glory. And we are among those whom he selected, both from the Jews and from the Gentiles. Um, we're gonna stop there because I think that might be all the farther that we get um, tonight. 
But the, uh, when, when we're going through the book of Romans and we get through chapter 8, there's a little bit of a change of Paul's focus. <clears throat> and you know, this is a letter, but when you write a long letter, there's different themes, right, in the letter. And, and so he's going through this, and this is kind of a little bit of a theme change when he gets into chapter 9. So let's just read just the last part of, of Romans 8 to see where he was, and then we'll kind of see where he's transitioning into. So Romans 8, starting in verse 38, he says, And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love, neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow, not even the power of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So he gets done with that. And then the Apostle Paul knows that there will be Jews that are saying things like, why do I need this Christ character? I'm a Jew. I'm a descendant of Abraham. I'm in with God. I'm, I'm right with God because of who I'm descended from. So he's anticipating that, that question or that wondering. So he addresses it more directly and personally now. He's kind of covered it in the rest of Romans but in this he really goes after it both from a personal standpoint we'll see at the beginning and, and in a very direct way so it's difficult to understand Romans chapter 9 without understanding that it's coming from a Jewish perspective so the Apostle Paul is writing to both Jews and Gentiles but in different sections of the letter, he's addressing it to the different groups. So in chapter 9, he's really addressing it to the mindset of the Jew. So if we understand that, we're not Jewish, but we can kind of, you know, think about, you know, they were raised under the law and, you know, everything was religious. And so we kind of know from their perspective what they're thinking. So the Apostle Paul shows them through their own scriptures. So he quotes the Old Testament in these next three chapters, 9, 10, and 11, more than any other chapter in the New Testament. He quotes a bunch of the Old Testament. Now, sometimes we think when we read this, we have this contrast of the Old and New Testament. But remember, at the time that Paul's writing this, the New Testament didn't exist. He was actually writing it, right? The letter that he was writing would be become the New Testament. But the New Testament didn't exist. All they had was the Old Testament, the Old Testament scriptures. So they knew that, hey, this guy Paul that's writing this, he's a big time dude. You know, they, they, you know the letter carried a lot of weight with them. They, they listened to what he said, but they weren't thinking this is scripture. Does that make sense, everybody? So, so he, he, he wasn't, you know, trying to prove from this letter that would become the New Testament. He was wanting to prove it from their scriptures, the Old Testament, so they would believe it. So he quotes all this Old Testament, as we'll see. And it's very apparent that it's super important to the Apostle Paul and to the Holy Spirit so the Holy Spirit inspired Paul to write the words. He didn't like take control of his hand, you know, but he inspired in him to write all these things that we read. So as, as Paul is writing this letter, he's being inspired by the Holy Spirit what to write. And it's very apparent that he sees this as important that everybody that's reading this letter understands that Christianity is not a new religion. It's the fulfillment of Judaism. So it's just a continuation of what God had already started. It wasn't like, hey, let's make up something new. He's saying, no, it's what started in Judaism, but is fulfilled in Christ. So it's this 
you know, continual thing that, that's going on. So he uses the Old Testament law, remember, to prove that we're sinners. He says, you know, that we've all sinned, fall short of the glory of God. None of us can obey the law. So he's using their Old Testament scriptures to prove these things. And he's answering, you know, very obvious and very important questions like this. Why didn't all the Jews accept Jesus as Messiah? You know, if they were God's chosen people, if God chose them and Jesus was God's plan, why didn't they all accept it? Why didn't they just all get on board, you know, because God was doing this new thing. And, and then the second question would be, well, since they didn't, what's God's plan? You know, how's he going to handle that? You know, that, that, hey, it didn't quite work out as it seemed like it was going to. And, and this is stuff that God all had planned even before the foundation of the earth. This plan was all set up. So the Jews in the Apostle Paul's time, they made this critical mistake and, and it affects um, even today. And, and this is part of the question that, that you were asking earlier. The, the critical mistake that they made is they looked at the Messiah coming as an earthly takeover because they were being controlled by the heavy handed Roman government, right? The Roman government that had their hand in their pockets and, you know, was taxing them heavily, heavily regulating them, everything that they do. They were under control of this external government that came in and took them over. So the Jews are thinking, yeah, the Messiah is going to come and he's going to overthrow the empire. He's going to overthrow the Roman Empire. He's going to throw down on them and he's going to take them over and, and then we're going to be on the top. That's what they thought of. So what happens when your thinking is that the Hulk's going to show up and beat up Caesar and instead a little baby shows up, you know? It, it totally was different than what they thought. Even though the birth of Christ had been prophesied in the Old Testament, they had been so brainwashed, if you will, of this Messiah is going to come and throw down and take over the Roman government. So they had this mindset. So they missed the real mission of the Messiah was to bring new life, was to take care of our sins, was to give us the new birth, the new life, to reconnect us to God that we had fallen away from. That was the real mission, but they missed that because they were thinking it was going to be something different. Pray for me, my battery just gave me a little message. <laughs> so, so, you know, but, but we can also make the reverse mistake in Romans 9 and think that everything is about salvation in Romans 9, which it's not. And we'll differentiate the things that are and the things that aren't because sometimes it talks about God choosing people but he's not choosing who will be saved and who won't be saved he's choosing people for service for, to do specific things so let's dive into it um, starting back in verse 1 of Romans 9 and th these first three verses are, are just super intense I don't know if you caught that when I read through it but, but try to feel the Apostle Paul's heart in these first three verses. He says, with Christ as my witness, I speak with utter truthfulness. My conscience and the Holy Spirit confirm it. My heart is filled with bitter sorrow and unending grief. Why? For my people my Jewish brothers and sisters, I would be willing to be forever cursed, cut off from Christ, if that would save them. Now, let's think about that first just on a personal level. How many people do you think of that way about? <laughs> that you would give up your life, that you would give up your salvation, that you would give up your relationship with Christ in order that they would be saved. 
maybe a spouse, maybe your kids, you know, there, there's probably a very small group, right? The Apostle Paul was saying a whole nation. He, he would give up his own relationship with God just if his Jewish brothers and sisters would receive. And, you know, of course, he can't, right? He doesn't have the power to, I mean, he's not a good enough sacrifice, right? But he doesn't need to because there's already been a sacrifice. So, so he doesn't need to give that up. Whoa, we just shut down. <laughs> good thing I have another one. Now, if this one does that, we're totally going to be winging it. <laughs> so, the Apostle Paul is um, he's saying that he's willing to give up himself. Now, the, the scripture that, that is really the heart of the controversy that we talked about where it says that God um, loved Jacob but hated Esau, that's where kind of the, the start of this, what I would call going off teaching comes from. And that is, there's a large group of people, it's not a small group that believe this, but that God chooses who is saved and who's not. That before the foundation of the earth, God said, okay, you and you, but you, you and me, we're damned to hell. Like God has already made that decision. And, and they already think that. Now, this first scripture in, in chapter 9, the first section, we see that, that um, the Apostle Paul's feeling on this, it, it doesn't really reflect that, right? First of all, it doesn't reflect what's called universalism, and that is that everybody's saved, you know, regardless of what they do, that everybody is saved. And there's a certain amount of people that teach and believe that, and that's not true. Um, we know that the people that are saved are the people that believe, right, that receive Jesus. But the fact that the Apostle Paul is, is having this sorrow, it makes me think, well... Is the, does the Apostle Paul love people that God doesn't even love? <laughs> you know, the Apostle Paul is willing to give up his life for people that Jesus wasn't willing to give up his life. Like if God chose, you're going to hell regardless of what you believe, regardless of what you do, then he didn't love them, right? If he did, what kind of love is that? <laughs> you know, he didn't love them and Christ didn't die for them. But yet the Apostle Paul said he loved him and he would die for him. So, so that to me is just not congruent. It, it just doesn't go together. So the Apostle Paul is claiming his love for them. But if God doesn't love them, that would just seem weird to me that the, the Apostle Paul loves people that God doesn't. So let's look at some examples of God's what's called salvific love or God's love for people that desires to save them. The first one is, you know, the very popular scripture, John three sixteen, that says, for God so loved the world, right? The world, he, he loved the world. It doesn't say, and the people that believe this, you know, that God picked you and you and you, you, you are going to hell. They have to take a scripture like this and redefine the word world. Well, what God really meant was he loved this small section of the world. I'm like, where do you get that? Like, there's a word, a Greek word that you could use there, right? And don't you think the Holy Spirit would be smart enough to use that word that meant that? No, he said that he so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him, Whoever, not just this small cross section of humanity, but whoever believes, who if the call goes out to everybody, and if you decide to believe, it says you shall not perish, but have eternal life. Check out this one. I think it's even clearer here in First Timothy chapter two, starting verse three. It says, "This is good and pleases God our Savior." 
who wants everyone to be saved and to understand the truth. For there is one God and one mediator who can reconcile God and humanity, the man Christ Jesus. He gave his life to purchase freedom for everyone. This is the message God gave to the world at just the right time. So I think it's pretty hard to fit this doctrine of God chooses, some will be saved, some are going to hell, no matter what they do. It's hard to fit that into these other scriptures, right? So remember at the beginning when I said, if there is a scripture that's a little bit difficult, use scriptures that are very simple to say what that means. So, so these are very straightforward that God's desire, now does God save everyone? No. He makes salvation available to everyone. Jesus died for everyone, but he does not handcuff you and say, come on, you're coming with me to heaven. No, it's a choice that we make. How? By believing in him. So he doesn't save everyone, but he sent his son to save everyone. And then they choose whether they receive it or not. So verse four, it says, they are the people of Israel chosen to be God's adopted children. God revealed his glory to them. He made covenants with them and gave them his law. He gave them the privilege of worshiping him and receiving his wonderful promises. So the Apostle Paul, he gets done saying his own love for them and how he would give up his life for them. And then he goes through this list and it's like, if anybody should be receiving Jesus, it should be the Jews. Because look what God did for them. He gave them the law. They were God's chosen people. He, they were the first people that God chose to partner with. He himself, you know, they had the, the tabernacle that went around with them in the wilderness where the presence of God was. He was actually with them, not these other people. He was physically, his presence was with them. So if anybody should be receiving, it should be the Jews. And then here in verse five, he starts to make his case. He says, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are their ancestors. And Christ himself was an Israelite as far as his human nature is concerned. So he's saying, um, he kind of restates the promise. If you remember the, the promise that was given to Abraham, God chose Abraham out of the mass of people, right? He could have chosen anybody, but he chose Abraham, who at that time was a Gentile. If anybody that's not a Jew is a Gentile, Abraham started out as a Gentile because there were no Jews. He chose Abraham to start this new like nation of people, the Jewish people, and he said, through your seed, all the families of the earth will be blessed. So he said, this promise that I'm giving you goes through you down through your generations. Now, if you understand Judaism, Judaism is big time on genealogy. Like when you read the Bible, you read all these and so-and-so begot so-and-so and so begot so-and-so, -and -so, right? And, and Judaism, they're really into tracing back genealogies. And that's why they always call God. They say God, he, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So that's the first three generations of this new covenant, this new blessing that God is bringing. So the Jews, as soon as the apostle Paul said this in the letter, they would know exactly what he was talking about because Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was a very common thing for them to say because it was the first three generations of this genealogy. And then he says, and Jesus, this is super important, Jesus came through that lineage. So the, the promise that God gave to Abraham was basically Jesus. That Jesus would come through your genealogy. You know, great, 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 great
at some point, Jesus would come out of that genealogy. So that's really important to understand. If you miss that, you get off track for the whole thing. He's talking about how the promise comes through that genealogy. It goes on, verse 5, and says, And he is God, the one who rules over everything and is worthy of eternal praise. Amen. Then he throws out the question of the hour, the million-dollar question, the question that all the Jews at this time would be asking. Verse 6, he says, Well then, has God failed? Has God failed to fulfill his promise to Israel? If they were God's chosen people, if the Jews were the people that God chose, has he failed? Because none of them are accepting, or very few of them are accepting Jesus. So, so has God failed to fulfill his promise? But was that his original plan? Listen to the Apostle Paul. Listen to how he says this. He says, after asking this rhetorical question, he's kind of setting up this, you know, like fake argument with this Jew that would be arguing with him. You know, hey, I'm a Jew, I'm a descendant of Abraham. You know, there's this fake guy that Paul Paul kind of makes up and has this, you know, made up argument with him. So after asking this question, has God failed? He says, no, for not all who were born into the nation of Israel are truly members of God's people. Being descendants of Abraham doesn't make them truly Abraham's children. So basically what he's saying is you can't be right with God based on your granddaddy. Great, 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 great granddaddy. Or I could say it this way. You can't get saved on Ancestry.com. <laughs> You, you can't go on Ancestry.com and trace your ancestry. Oh, yeah, I'm a descendant of Abraham. I'm good with God. He's saying it doesn't work that way. You can't just say that you're a descendant physically of this guy and, and, and you're right with God. For the scriptures say, Isaac is the son through whom your descendants will be counted, though Abraham had other children too. So Isaac was the chosen son of Abraham that the lineage would go through. There was other children, but God didn't choose those children. He chose Isaac. So, and again, th this is super important to understand. Isaac was not chosen for salvation at that time. God wasn't saying, okay, Isaac, you're going to be saved. And his brother, no, you're going to hell. That's not what God was saying. God was choosing Isaac for the purpose of the propagation of the genealogy that the Messiah would come out of. Does that make sense? He, he was choosing who would, you know, go down that line. So Isaac was choosen, chosen for that purpose. Now, did it have something to do with salvation? Absolutely, because Jesus would come out of that, and Jesus ultimately is how we get saved. So it had something to do with salvation, but he wasn't picking and choosing who was saved and who wasn't. So this is, of course, contrasting Isaac and his brother Ishmael, right? So Abraham originally, you know, when, when God said, you're going to have a son, Abraham kind of took inventory <laughs> of the situation and realized that he was over 100, <laughs> And Sarah was, I don't know how old, but she was way too old to have kids. So Abraham's like, well, you know, God said it'll happen that way, but I'll just help God out, right? How many of you have done that? Well, I'll just help God out. So Abraham has sex with one of his female servants and has a son, Ishmael. And God goes, no, that's not what I said. See, what, what the Apostle Paul is contrasting here. And, and he is using this as an example of salvation. He's saying, you don't do it yourself. You, you don't get saved yourself. You don't just say, okay, God, I got this, and you do it yourself. No, God has said, 
I'm going to have, I'm going to show up and, and Sarah's going to have a kid. Not, not your servant girl, but Sarah, you and Sarah, husband and wife, are going to have a child, Isaac. Now, so, so this is differentiating between the I can do it myself thinking, I can get to God based on the law, just be good enough, obey enough, do it myself, versus no, I can't do it myself, I have to rely on God. So can you see the difference between Ishmael and Isaac? Ishmael is I'll do it myself. Isaac is I'll rely on God. So God chose Isaac because he's the rely on God. Verse eight, it says, this means that Abraham's physical descendants are not necessarily children of God. Only the children of the promise are considered to be Abraham's children. For God had promised, this is what the promise was, I will return about this time next year and Sarah will have a son. So he was very specific about how the promise would come and that is that Sarah, Abraham's wife, would have a son, Isaac, and that would be who the genealogy would go through. So God had a way that he was going to do it, even though Abraham tried to mess it up and did something different. So did God fail? No, Abraham failed. Abraham was a goofball, but God still had his plan of how it was gonna happen. Verse 10, this son was our ancestor Isaac. Again, this is the apostle Paul who is a Jew, and he's talking to Jews, he says, this son was our ancestor, Isaac. And when Isaac married Rebecca, she gave birth to twins. Now, I mean, you know, they didn't have that machine that they can tell how many babies are in there, right? So she didn't know there was twins in there at the time that she was pregnant. It says in verse 11, but before they were born, before they had done anything good or bad. So they're not even born yet, right? They couldn't have sinned. They couldn't have made any mistakes. They couldn't have done anything good. They weren't even born yet. It says she received a message from God. This message shows that God chooses people according to his own purposes. He calls people, but not according to their good or bad works. So we've seen between Isaac and Ishmael that he doesn't choose, you know, based on, you know, your lineage or, you know, who your granddaddy is or anything like that. He, he doesn't choose based on that. And then here we're seeing that he doesn't choose according to your performance. He, he chose Isaac before they had done anything good or bad. So it wasn't like he said, well, they're both pretty good, but Isaac's a little bit better. I'm going to choose him. No, he chose it just out of his own purpose. He said, this is how it's going to happen. So it says, she was told, your older son will serve the younger son. In the words of the scriptures, I love Jacob. And in the NLT, it says, but I rejected Esau. I like this terminology, but I want to deal with the, the hate issue. Because most versions say, I love Jacob, but I hated Esau. So let's deal with that issue first. Now, the word hate here, it's not like how we think of hate. You know, like when you hate somebody, you want to just destroy their life. You want to make things bad for them. You may want to beat them up. You know, you, you just have this hatred for them. The word hate here does not mean that. The word literally, I mean, the literal definition means to love less. So he's saying that he loved Jacob, but he loved Esau less. And it's always in the context of choosing, of choosing between two things. Now, something that all of us are familiar with here is when we were in grade school, and remember the gym teacher chose two captains, right? And then the captains each chose their team, right? So there's a group of the whole class, this guy chooses one, then this guy chooses one, then this guy chooses one, this guy chooses one. 
Well, pretty soon it gets down to the end and there's only two left, you and the guy with the broken leg in the wheelchair. <laughs> and the guy's like, oh, who should I choose? <laughs> so you could say, he chose you, right? Because the other guy's in a wheelchair. He, you could say he loved one, but hated the other. See, all it means is that he thought of one a little bit more than the other, right? So he chose that one over the other. So let's see an example of this, real world example, in Luke chapter 14, verse 26. And just because of the language used, it's easier to understand, I'm using the NIV. Luke 14, 26 says, and this is a very common scripture that we all know, but we want to ignore it because we don't really understand it. So, you know, what we normally do when we don't understand something, we just skip it, right? <laughs> yeah, and we go on to the next one. But Luke 14, 26 says, if anyone comes to me, this is Jesus talking, and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. Okay, you can't be his disciple unless you hate your wife, unless you hate your mom. <laughs> you know, that, that doesn't even make sense, right? Well, hate is not how we think of it. Hate is a choosing, a loving less. How many of you know if you want to be God's disciple, you got to pick God above your wife, right? You got to pick God above your mom, your kids, your everything. Does that mean that you hate these other people? Not in the sense that we do. That just says that we are choosing God. And really that choosing God makes you have a better relationship with your wife and your mom and your kids. And, you know, so that hate is not, a, I hate that person. It's just, I'm choosing somebody else above them. So when he says, I love Jacob and I hate Esau, he's saying, I'm choosing Jacob for, for this, you know, path, this, this lineage that the Messiah will come out of. Not that, you know, Esau was, you know, rejected. And some people say Esau went to hell, but I don't see anywhere in the Bible that says that. Esau actually was blessed later on by Jacob. Now, if you read the story, Jacob and Esau were like this, right? But Jacob was the weak one. He was scared of Esau. But it says the, the younger will, or the older will serve the younger. So he's kind of proving two different things here. One of them is, and they were twins, right? The, the birthright or the blessing of the family always went to the firstborn. Now, they were twins, so the time separation, of course, is very small, but Esau came out first. So he was the firstborn. So typically, according to our way of doing things, he would be the one. But God said, no, I'm not choosing Esau. So he's saying, all these rules that you have made up, I'm not following them. <laughs> God's not following our rules. We're following God's rules. So, so God chose Jacob over Esau. Now, again, this is really important. God chose him for what? For salvation to be saved? No, he chose them for a purpose. He chose Jacob for the lineage that the Messiah would come through. So the blessing or the promise, he chose Jacob to be that line that it would come out of, not Esau. So he wasn't saying Jacob's going to heaven and Esau's going to hell. That's not what he was talking about. He was talking about purpose or service. He was choosing the one that the promise would come through. So again, wasn't choosing individuals for salvation. That's just a mistake that people get from this. So we know, you know, that Isaac would be saved and, and you know, we think, well, Ishmael was damned. We don't see that anymore in the Bible, you know? It just doesn't say that. So. Now, the other thing that's important to see here is that he wasn't choosing just the individuals. He was choosing nations. So he's choosing like a people group that Jesus would come through. 
And we see that here in the story that the Apostle Paul is quoting from in the Old Testament. And this is called um, corporate election versus individual election. So again, some people think that Jacob was being individually chose that he was going to heaven and Esau was being individually chose that he was going to hell. But really God was choosing a corporate group or a people group. And again, this to me is so clear if we just read the scripture that the Apostle Paul is quoting from. Genesis 25, starting verse 22, it says, But the boys pushed against each other inside of her. Now, she, again, they didn't have the technology to know that there was two in there. She just knew there was a lot of activity, right? And there was a lot going on on the inside of her. And she said, If this is what it's like, why did it happen to me? How many pregnant women have you heard say that? Well, if I knew it was going to be like this, <laughs> I would have gotten off the train. But it says, so she went to ask the Lord and the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb. Two different peoples will emerge from your body. One people will be stronger than the other. The older will serve the younger. Now, we never see, never in the Bible, do we see Esau serving Jacob individually. Jacob was afraid of Esau. He didn't even want to get in contact with him. We never see that. But we see the, the people that came out of Esau, his descendants, people group, were called the Edomites, and they later did serve the Israelites, the Jewish people. So we see that he's not talking just about the individuals, he's talking about the nations that would come from the individuals. Verse 24 says, when she reached the end of her pregnancy, then she discovered she had twins. So at that point, God is just telling her this stuff, but she doesn't know what's going on, and then both come out. So God, again, through the individuals, was choosing nations, people groups that would carry the promise to be a blessing to the whole earth. So not only was their choice not based on their actions, in other words, it wasn't earned, but it did not go along with that custom of the day that the older one, Esau, came out first. He should have been the one but God chose Jacob. So God was kind of turning the tables on them, but God kind of always does that. I mean, God has a history of choosing the weak, right? He, he says um, that, that God will use the weak to confound the strong. He'll use the silly to confound the people that are wise. He always does that kind of thing. And just a couple examples, David, when King David was chosen to be king, the, the prophet Samuel, that God told him that the next king would come out of Jesse's house. He goes over to Jesse's house and looks at all his big tough sons, you know, and kind of goes through them one after one after one. He's like, no, no, do you have any other kids? Oh, no, that's, oh, that's right, there's David, little skinny David, out with the sheep. He chose the weakest one to be the king. Remember when Gideon had that massive army and he was gonna go fight the Philistines. What did God, his first step was, God paired the huge army from like 10,000 down to how many? 300. <laughs> he made the army weaker so that he could get the glory out of the battle. So God oftentimes will choose the weaker things based on natural things, you know, the things that we think matter, how many of you would rather have 10,000 than 300 going into a, a battle? You know, the things that we think, God sometimes chooses those other things that, that we don't think are better. So God was doing it his way, and some may think that's not fair. So the Apostle Paul throws out another question. The Apostle Paul asks it and answers it. Verse 14, are we saying then that God was unfair. Of course not. Was it unfair to choose Jacob over Esau? Because Esau was the firstborn, he should have been the one. Was it unfair to choose Jacob? Of course not. For God said to Moses, 
I will show you mercy, or I will show mercy to anyone I choose. God's the one, right? He, he's the one that chooses between. Now, again, it's not for salvation. It's for who is going to do a, a specific purpose. I will show mercy to anyone I choose, and I will show compassion to anyone I choose. So it is God who decides to show mercy. We can neither choose it nor work for it. So again, he, he's saying that God makes that decision of whether to show mercy. We can't choose it. We can't work for it. We can't earn it. So this is actually referring to a time when Moses was leading the, the children of Israel out of Egypt into the promised land. And Moses was just flat out fed up with the people because they were goofballs. They were doing all sorts of crazy stuff. And Moses was like, man, maybe God, you should just wipe them all out. <laughs> maybe you should just get rid of all of them. And, and God says to Moses, I'll show mercy on who I decide to show mercy. It's not up to you, Moses. It's up to me. I'm God. He's God. He, he knows what he's looking for. He, he knows that, that, that he's going to make the decision. He doesn't need help from us deciding who to show mercy on. So, and here we come up again, and we're going to end with this, this very misunderstood scripture. And, and I'll give it that it is a little complicated if you don't understand it in the whole context of what this all has said so far. Verse 17, it says, For the scriptures say that God told Pharaoh. How many of you have heard of the, you know, that God made Pharaoh, or Pharaoh bad, you know, before the foundation of the earth, all that kind of stuff comes from this. For the scriptures say that God told Pharaoh, I have appointed you for the very purpose of displaying my power in you and to spread my fame throughout the earth. So you see, God chooses to show mercy on some and he chooses to, and this is the key phrase, harden the hearts of others so they refuse to listen. So some people think, you know, God forced Pharaoh, you know, created him from the foundation of the earth to be evil, to be bad. And God just doesn't willy nilly decide to harden somebody. Like, like somebody saying, God, I really want to serve you. Sorry, punk, I'm hardening your heart. God just doesn't do that. There's nowhere in the Bible where that happens. Now, this process is called judicial hardening. And this word harden, a really more literal translation of it would be to strengthen. So what it literally means is to harden or strengthen something that already exists. So God's not just out of nowhere deciding I'm going to harden that person. He's hardening a decision that they've already made. And we see this in Pharaoh's life. Pharaoh hardened his own heart five times in Scripture before God ever hardened his heart. Here's one of the examples in Exodus 8.15. It says, but when Pharaoh saw that there was relief. See, a lot of these times, you know, when things were looking really bad, Pharaoh was ready to give in. Okay, you can go. But as soon as things got a little better, then he changed his mind, right? And so this is one of those times. It says, when he saw that there was relief, he hardened his heart. Pharaoh hardened his own heart and would not listen to Moses and Aaron just as the Lord had said. So there's five instances of that, of Pharaoh hardening his heart, making a decision before it ever says that God hardened his heart. So God used Pharaoh's already hardened heart to harden it further for his purpose. He wasn't like taking somebody like Pharaoh was saying, oh, I want to let the people go. Yeah, go and have a good time. Here's a brewski. You know, he, he, he wasn't like all cheery. He had already decided, no, I'm against God. 
I'm against the people of God. So it was that God used that to bring about his purpose. So remember one of the things that it said is that, that he hardened Pharaoh's heart to spread God's fame throughout the earth. If you remember the story of when they were um, going out of Egypt and, and they sent spies into the land and, and the spies were in this certain town and the people were trying to, to get them, to kill them, and Rahab the prostitute hides the spies from the guys that were trying to get them. Do you know what she said, why she did it? Because she had heard what had happened to Pharaoh. So God used hardening of Pharaoh's already hardened heart to spread his fame out that this prostitute had heard about it and rescued the spies that God had sent into the land because of what God had done in Pharaoh's life. Now, Pharaoh, you know, God didn't just, you know, make him that way. He had already made himself that way. He had already chosen that. So the first Passover, which was, you know, when, when uh, there, there was going to be a death angel that was going to come and kill all the kids below a certain age. And the Jewish people um, put lamb's blood, remember, on their doorposts so the death angel would pass over their house and, and not kill their, their little babies. So that was the first Passover. That was a sign of the blood of Jesus that would protect us. So God used Pharaoh's hardened heart to cause the first Passover. And God used the hardened hearts of Jewish leaders later to bring about the second Passover. Because think about this. What if all the Pharisees, you know, the Jewish leaders, all the heavy hitters, what if they would have been like, wow, Jesus, you're awesome. They would have never crucified Jesus, right? Jesus wouldn't have been crucified because, you know, if most of the people recognized Jesus as the Messiah and thought, you're awesome, you're the one, he would have never gotten crucified. So it's not like God made the Pharisees harden. They had already hardened their hearts, right? They were already against Jesus. They were already Jesus' main antagonist. So God used their already hardened hearts to fulfill his plan, which was the crucifixion of Jesus. So, so that's how God uses hardened hearts. Now, we're not going to go into this, but here's the million-dollar question again. Verse 19, we'll get into this next week. It says, well, then you might say, why does God blame people for not responding? Haven't they simply done what he makes them do? How, how can you hold people accountable if God's the one that is hardening their hearts? Well, as we've already seen, God doesn't start the hardening process. He finishes it. They, they've already decided that. So, of course, the answer is no, you know, that you can't blame people for not responding because they're not doing what God has caused them to do. God doesn't force us or cause us to do anything. So we'll see that next week. So I um, hope you guys got something out of that tonight. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for your word that's alive and powerful. God, I just pray for just the Holy Spirit to, to bring revelation to our lives out of what we've learned tonight. God, we thank you for this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh oh, we got a little battery on this too. My battery is in your computer bag and that flat. That's weird. We have to charge all of our stuff before we come in.